Hi, I'm Darren Maloney, and you're listening to In Conversation With. Can we get one podcast where I don't get called out for being a 25-year-old? I'm 25. You're not recording it. Uh, I wish I was 25. Would you stop? <laughs> but see, I'm a mature student, but I don't look it. You know, so yeah. I don't like it either. And modest as well. Very modest. Mm-hmm. Um, got ID'd for Red so Bull. <laughs> yeah. I did so get ID'd for Red Bull. Fucking go with that, will you? Yeah. Don't be giving out about it. Well, exactly. Look. In ten years' time, you're going to be thanking your lucky stars that yeah. you have this little. Either that, or using a shitload of keel stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He does use a face cream. Oh okay. come Listen. on! And why wouldn't he? Go. Greg, this isn't. You can't record this bit. <laughs> are you happy with? Yeah, everyone's yeah. ready to go. Cool. Work away. Right. You are listening to In Conversation with. My name is Colm, and as always, I am joined by my lovely co-host, Mr. Gavin Kelly. How you doing, Mr. Greg Mohawk? How are we today, how lads? Are, how are we, gentlemen? Not too bad. My throat now, as you can probably tell, is not in the best of shape. Um, I don't know, and it's only gotten a wee bit worse. But you know, I'm here. I'm excited. You have you have water today. I do. Have you're water. not you're not going to beg any of our guests for water. No. Good. Okay, I'm glad. I, I Greg, bought, I bought water. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, nice fresh walk to college this morning, and. Um, Made it all the easier, knowing that we had a very, very good interview coming up today. Yeah, and joining us today is RT Sports broadcaster, Mr. Darren Maloney. Hello there. My throat is fine, by the way. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. thanks. Yeah. yeah, mine is all right. Greg, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm okay. Okay, cool. I'm start. drinking the water. Yeah. Um, so, before I start, I would like to offer a thanks to Mr. Ross Munley of the alumni hey. office here in DCU, and obviously close personal friend of the podcast for setting this up. <laughs> Thank you, Ross, which actually prompts my first question. So my first question is generally, what was the initial thought when I approached the guest asking to be on the podcast? Okay. But of course, it was Ross first of all. So yeah. what, what did you what did you think when Ross asked you? Well, I li- listen. I know Ross a long time. Um, he's a really good friend. He'll probably kill me for saying that. Um, but I know him through Leash Football, um, and I think I was there when the day he made his championship debut oh, against thing. Offaly in 03, and my dad was there. I'm half Offaly, good or bad half, but anyway, <laughs> you can you can make up your own mind and. Um, Ross won man of the match and I had to give him the trophy afterwards. <laughs> like It was h- hilarious, this big crystal, Galway crystal thing. Um, but I've, I've just, I know him since then. I helped out a bit with his studies towards the end of his, his degree here in DCU. So, um, no, listen, I do anthem for Ross, within reason, but I would do anthem yeah. for Ross. So you, you weren't too apprehensive when he said, I'm throwing you in a room with three students? No, not at all. I know he wouldn't put me in harm's way deliberately. Okay. I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> and actually, this is something, because I know a lot of our guests do kind of do a little bit of research on us before they come on, i.e. listen to the podcast. You said that you listened to a couple. Mm-hmm. Um, what, did, what did you think, actually? Really good. That? Yeah. Like I, do you know what? It's funny. I suppose the technology changes so quickly, and it's so long ago that I was in college. I'd love to have had... We used to make... Um, our own radio programs when I was in college with like the reel to reel recorders <laughs> you've seen them in the museum um, they're very old but we used to do all that stuff like in the studios and but but a podcast is so look that's the great thing about radio first of all that it's just this very you can go anywhere with a recorder and off you go you don't need the fancy studio or makeup or cameras or floor managers or auto cue you just off you go and that's the magic of it so it's a really person personal medium, mm-hmm. um, and uh, like I just like I'm I'm I, I suppose the last couple of years I've discovered podcasts, so I'm a bit addicted to probably not the stuff you're listening to, but um, <laughs> you know just a lot of sports ones and a bit of American politics and stuff like that. So very good. Um, yeah, no. How, keep, how, keep how, do, how do we match up? Are we okay? Oh, very high up okay. there. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah. you've sub- you've subscribed to us on all major podcasting platforms. I think I probably have. Good. Yes. Good. Good. Yes. Good. Now, now, if I haven't, I will after. <laughs> <laughs> we'll check, don't you worry. see what you've done with this. <laughs> <laughs> or listen, sorry. Right, so, Dara, take mm. us back. So, was oh. a career in broadcasting always in your mind growing up? Um, probably. Um, I'll go back to, now this is a long time ago, in a galaxy I'll, far, I'll far away. some kind of, you know, kind yeah. of uh, <laughs> yeah. sound effect that's like, you know. Yeah, a rickshaw back. and, you know, tumbleweed and all that stuff. No, I, I always had a, a, through a pal of mine, Michael Murphy, uh, I'm allowed to mention him, he won't sue, um, yes, he'll sue you actually, not me, so it's grand. I mentioned Michael. Um, I mentioned we, that our expense budget isn't that big. That's either. fine, no, but look, <laughs> you get free legal aid, you'll be grand. Okay. Um, I'll be out of the country, but no, he, we used to mess around, we, we kind of just love music. Um, and always used, you know, just uh, kind of buying, L, you know, LPs and EPs and all that sort of thing. And Michael one day came up with this mad idea. He he got he had an old uh, record player in his house, and he he started to have a fascination with pirate radio, which in the late eighties, well, mid to late eighties, was was very strong. 
There was no uh, FM 104, 98. There was no Broadcasting Commission uh, at that time, or BAI, I think they're called now. Um, they are indeed. And he decided one day that we would come up with our own, we'd make our own radio station in his bedroom uh, with two pals of mine. And he got, the ra- he got the record player and he connected his mother's curling tongs to it. And we started messing around that way. Now, it wasn't heard anywhere, <laughs> but like we were 13 or 14, voice hadn't broken. It was, yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, very squeaky. Um, so we started messing around a bit and making demo tapes and, you know, on old cassettes. Again, mm-hmm. have a Google it. Yeah, cassettes. <laughs> it's a long story. Um, but we, we did some of that stuff. And um, like Michael was always really mad into it and, and, and you know, got a couple of gigs on community radio and in uh, North Dublin up in Coolock. NDCR oh, it was yeah. called. It's, oh, I think it's become oh. near FM. Ah, there you but go. But there you go. See, it, it was a weird time because you had all the, you know, you had like Sunshine Radio, Radio Nova, Energy, Radio Dublin was there for a while. And like these were all set up as legitimate businesses. It, it was pirate radio because it wasn't legal. Um, but uh, they, they were some operating. But they were if. operating and these guys, you know, the guys and girls working there were paying tax and mm-hmm. it was PAYE and everything was properly registered. But they didn't have a formal license, which you get now. So uh, there was a minister, Ray Burke, a uh, communications minister from not too far from here. And he, along with the government of the day, Fianna Fáil government, decided, right, we need to regulate this. Because there was an awful lot of money being made at the time. Um, and, you know, they were taking advertising. They were doing everything correctly. Some of them were, not all of them. And they said, we've got to regulate this. We've got to issue licenses. Um, so Capital Radio came out, it wasn't first. Uh, 98 FM, I think, um, was first classic hits 98 FM it was called um, they wanted to have licenses all around the country Galway Bay FM I think um, County Sound in Cork you know CKR Carlo Kilkenny um, what's the one in Wexford I can't think anyway the Radio Kerry um, Highland Radio so everybody applied for these licenses and on New Year's Eve 1987 uh, all the, the pirate stations in inverted commas had to shut down now we were doing uh, myself and Michael were playing records in NDCR and I was reading out sports stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, in, uh, when, when that finished, like I was still in school, I was like, hang on, 87, so 15. Okay. And we did a few little kind of pirate bits and pieces, just with music, messing around. The two of us doing a radio show together. He'd do one link, I'd do the other. Because we both loved music, um, you know, and, and that was a bit of laugh and it was scary and all that stuff as well. But never thought, I'm not going to make a career of this. No way. This is just the dust. And at, at 15 now, I suppose you would have to be start thinking about what you're going to do. And I'm sure your parents are saying, do you though? Do you? Uh, uh, you do. At 15? Mm. Oh, well, you have to have an idea, like, don't you? Not really. Well, an idea. Like, I, listen, I know my kids, you know, like say, Hannah, my, my second daughter is doing, um, Kate's in here. She's in DCU. Um, St. Pat's, so um, she's studying to be a teacher. Hannah, I want to do business. You know, she's doing her leaving cert in June. So, um, you know, but look, I, I'd be, I suppose as I get older, I'm like, you don't necessarily have to, okay. uh, you know, uh, like, let's see where she ends up. And they always say you'll have two careers in your lifetime. So that's, I'm, I want to know what mine's, my second <laughs> one's going to be. I have a fair idea. But um, no, like we, we were messing around, doing the bits and pieces. I did, um, volunteered as a load of us did in um, Beaumont Hospital Radio. And we, ah, it was like we had, you know, the playlist selector and myself and another two, Michael was still there. Um, I followed him everywhere. <laughs> uh, he now works in the Department of Foreign Affairs. But um, there's his we, second career. Yeah, that, there you go. <laughs> um, and I think he still does a bit of uh, uh, DJing and things like that. But um, while we were, do, like, we, we did the hospital radio stuff. Um, I did my leave insert, didn't get enough points to get into DCU, went and did another journalism course. And in the meantime, then we were still doing the hospital radio stuff. Um, I we, we got we had an agreement with Airtel and RTE. Um, that's Teletext. Teletext. By the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's like it's funny. Live score now on your on your phone <laughs> is the new Teletext. teletext. Like we used to watch football matches on Teletext. You go, oh, there's a goal, or you know, bizarre. I but do, we, I do remember I do Teletext, teletext, teletext yeah. now. Not yeah, yeah. Tom, no, Tom still listen, loves the hey, Teletext. Listen, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just being kind to you. But anyway, <laughs> um, so we carry on. But um, we, we we ran a news service with some of the students from the course I was doing, where we did this kind of rip and read thing with with RT Airtel, where they gave us permission to use 
their news copy and a lot of the students who did the course with me we brought them up and we did news bulletins and we did them every hour and that sort of thing so that was look you, there was always those bits and pieces going on that um in the background yeah I but i suppose at that time i'd started studying journalism print radio mm-hmm. tv um and we, we just kind of went from there i i um did work experience in Century Radio, which is what Today FM has become now. Okay. It was the first na- uh, commercial national license mm-hmm. that was issued. Okay. And it, it went out of business in 1991. Um, and the week previously, I was in my second year in college, started my second year, and the week previously, they had offered me a full-time job there. And I actually, well, after a lot of consultation with my mom and my dad, turned it down. Because okay. I'd have to leave college. Who, who, how how is this working out now? Were you completely? I want to take this job, and they were saying no. no. I have to say, when I came when it came down to it, I was like, no, do you know what? This isn't right. I've got. I'll do another eight months of the course or whatever, and see where we are then. Yeah. But like the place. I remember coming home from college, sitting on the bus, listening to the radio, and I was on the twenty B bus, which kind of used. It, it doesn't. It goes across town now. It didn't then, but I I remember missing my stop because I heard I was listening to Century because I'd been on it a couple of times. Uh, listening to Century and um, they announced we're pulling the plug the money's gone blah 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 and I remember missing my stop like because I was like I was such, in such shock and I was like oh well that's the end of that career anyway you know so that's, um, yeah and then met Con Murphy who um, I followed a lot in Con has since he took early retirement but um, Con brought me into kind of he went to work in 104 then he brought me in there so I was doing college and then college during the week I'm working in 104 at the weekends reading out sports bulletins so um, but the sport thing was kind of like sports always been my hobby. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't think you could make a living out of it. I thought like when when I thought about the sort of journalism thing and more into broadcasting than print, um, I thought it'll be kind of news stuff yeah. because there's more opportunities with that. So the sports stuff just kind of happened by accident, and the accident continues to this day. So what sports did you play when you were younger? I played I played a fair bit of soccer, but what I was better at was hurling. Okay. Um, I used to, and when I'm saying better. I'm putting that in inverted commas. <laughs> I was ordinary. Um, I tried, and I, I, you know, I tried hard, but it just didn't. Any nice medals at home? Yeah, few, uh, my, my, no, my claim to fame is my uh, Dublin Minor Hurling Championship medal with St. Vincent's Very good. in 1989. Um, uh-huh. I actually brought it with me today. No, I didn't. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's funny. When, when, when we're sitting doing stuff with, uh, with Anthony Daly or with Henry Shefflin, and you're kind of like, now is not the time to tell the story <laughs> about... You know, the, the final in Parnell Park beating Kieran's. No, that's not the one. How many all earns does Henry have? He remember, just, that was good. Yeah, no, he just has 10. Well, 10, 10 intra county ones. Do you remember they gave him the jersey with 10? Oh, yeah. I, well, I hope I'm right. Can we edit this bit out? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we did a. We did a. We did have 20, club ones as well. Who, oh, yeah, yeah, obviously. No, but I think it was. I think it was I le- oh, have it in my head. It was I le- have it in this very. Oh, you do. We we did a, a twenty four hour broadcast for charity, um, TV broadcast. Uh, yeah. It happens every year, uh, every year here in DCU, and we actually Colin and I did a sports show. Yeah, and that was the question put to me, and I had yeah. to think about oh, it. Oh, it wasn't all Ireland. There was how many all stars? Oh, okay. All oh, right. Okay. okay. Yeah, there was one more. It's like I think well, well, we haven't given the answer. Eleven. Yeah. Wasn't oh, it? Eleven okay. all stars and Box. ten medals. Yeah. Because they gave him the jersey after he won the 10th yeah, one, yeah. Um, yeah. number 10 on the back. During the 24-hour uh, broadcast that we do here every year, I got to be Sue Barker for half an hour and host <laughs> the question of sport. Yeah. I was hosting it and Greg was one of the panellists. We had a lot of fun with it, actually. It's a good crack at doing the quizzes, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I, God, where did I start? Sorry, I'm, 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 uh, I'm boring myself at this stage. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it just kind of, you know, did, left college left college on the Friday and then got a six month contract in 104 to read sport for them like the following week mm-hmm. so um, I, don't, I don't think too many graduates are that lucky nowadays I'm not well pff, listen I'm, of course they will be but um, it's it's. I suppose and I've been getting away with it ever since <laughs> 20 something years later but um, yeah it's it's um, it's better than working for a living well I suppose they say if you do something you love you'll never work a day in your life yeah and look like, and the one, I suppose the one thing that I've always liked about it is that no no day is ever the same okay the elements are the same I'm going to a match or I'm going to sit in the studio or look at the like but the material you're doing is going to is going to it's going to be yeah. different you know so even the radio stuff I did a few weeks ago like I hadn't been in, I hadn't done any stuff in that studio for a long time um, and it was an interesting day but it was just different and it was uh, it was a challenge there's yes. nothing, nothing ordinary about it, you know. So, um, when did the big leagues come calling? The big leagues. Um, <laughs> well, one hundred and four was a big deal at the time, um, 
and it was doing very well in Dublin. 98 was the number one station. After I left, 104 became the number one station. Um, Coincidence, I'm sure. Yeah, like, no, you no, know. I'll put it out there and you can make your own mind up. <laughs> but um, no, I kind of had a, had this thing about RTE for a while because like, it was sort of the brass ring or whatever mm-hmm. phrase you want to put on it. And I tried, there was a, a lovely man called Ian Corr who was the head of sport there at the time. He's since retired, but... Um, and at, sorry, just at yeah. this stage, I had you said, okay, it's sport is kind of where I primarily yeah. want to... Yeah, well, for as long as it would continue. Mm-hmm. So what happened was, like, let's say, 92, I was full-time in 104. Mm-hmm. Um, Con Murphy, who, it's, you know, to this day, would still be my mentor. Everybody needs a mentor, but Con has just been such an incredible help to me personally, but professionally all of that stuff and he's a really dear friend um, and brilliant at what he does he's doing the greatest league in the world podcast at the moment the, mm-hmm. the league of ireland one um but con left to become a producer in rt radio so once that happened that was only a year later and like i think i was what was i 19 years of age and i became the head of sport in 104 now it wasn't a very big thing but we had like say adrian eames was working with me okay um, or you know, he was like I was the head of sport. He was one of the presenters. Dave Kelly, who works on RTE News now, he was there as well. Um, so there were three of us, and like we just, I suppose it is, it, it's the kind of, and I wonder what's going to happen to this sort of hourly sports bulletin model now. Um, you know, with with how much people are able to get on their phones, consume like I suppose yeah, without. like you know, it's like, it's like if you saw Tina Fey in the opening of the Oscars the other night. And she had this wise crack about saying, "We're gonna, we're not the host, but we're gonna stand here long enough so that people who get USA, USA Today tomorrow will think we did host the Oscars." <laughs> and it's, you know, like it's, when you get a newspaper now, invariably it's out of date, and you, in the meantime, you've got it on your phone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, the early we we had them like from seven in the morning in one o four, from seven in the morning until say that the soccer ended at ten at night. Mm-hmm. So that had to be manned, and you did it had a two minute bulletin all the time. Um, RTE, the NUJ members, and I think it was around ninety two, went on strike, okay. and that be, so there was no news or current affairs or sport output on RTE radio at the time, uh, and our crowd ramped it up, and we went like you know from seven to ten, uh, f- Monday through Sunday. Okay. So and it, that's the model it still has, mm-hmm. um, you know. So like it, that was really exciting at the time. Con was still there, so I suppose when he left one hundred four um, to go to RTE. I like I was ninety three. I I started kind of going after the RTE thing. Okay. Didn't know how like it's you know the closed shop bit and there were you know the the, the great broadcasters there the late Tom Rooney um you know Greg Allen is still there Des was there um who else there was like a whole host of Roy Willoughby um and Con Con was kind of the the younger breed so I just started kind of not bombarding but you know going was it mixtapes just. Yeah, bits Constance. and pieces. Like, I suppose because because like people can turn on the radio and listen to you, mm-hmm. so you don't necessarily if you're doing it, the demos aren't that important. I okay. think you know. Um, and again, like I wouldn't even know where to start putting together a demo tape now or a show reel. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how you like manage to keep that to an hour or something. I know, well, you see, but at the same time, if you're sending it to somebody, I would have thought now I haven't done this, but if you were sending it to somebody abroad, for example who has no idea who you are mm-hmm. like you've got to make the impact in the first sort of 15 20 seconds yeah i know myself when people send me stuff would you, to, would would you, you have it yeah the odd time yeah mm-hmm. just will you have a listen to this and see what you think and you know that after 15 seconds okay that person and this is quite yeah that's going to work or no it's not going to work mm-hmm. or that needs a lot of work mm-hmm. no i don't believe like everybody can broadcast but they need to be trained in the right way and and shown and taught the kind of right stuff to do. And I, it, I, I believe that. Is there anything that like, and it's something that we, we, we've often asked mm. a lot of um, a lot of our guests that have been in RT or were previously mm. in RT, have, did they ever in any way say, hey, your dialect, your your accent, was, it, was that ever a thing? Did you ever go for elocution lessons? No, or? no. Um, no, not at all. Um, that's, that's just the way I talk, okay. you know? Um, Actually, I remember it's funny, and this man still, I'm not gonna, I'm definitely not gonna name him. <laughs> I remember when I was in, hang on, I was still in, I'm just trying to get the timeline of this. I think I was in college, so the first year in college, and a news reading position came up in FM 104. And I had a demo tape, which we put a lot of effort into. Now, this is like I was 18 or something, and I sent it into him. He was the head of news or head of content, I can't remember, but I sent it into him. And the reply came back, think you should try out another career. Oh, wow. Broadcasting's not going to work for you. 
So I, it's funny, he hasn't popped into my mind in a long time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I've, I've met him since and just the old little Look, wink. He's laughing now. Oh, well, maybe he's still laughing. Maybe he's right, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe there is that second career thing. Mm. Still to come. So yeah, no, do you know what? And there's never been any, oh, you talk this way or that way or this, that, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, and that's like, I, I suppose, you know, that's who we are. It's what we, whether it's, a Dublin accent or an Offaly accent or a Leash accent or Kerry, it's who we are. So you talk the way you talk. Mm-hmm. Um, and like years ago, I think the, the BBC used to do the, hello, this is London. They were, they all had to have that style. Yeah. But, you know, listen, this is, this, you know, in the last 20 years, nobody's ever said to me, I want you, you, you know, I suppose you have to work at pronunciations or mm-hmm. with the soccer store, sports stuff, we'd always be at that. Yeah. Arisa Balaga and, you know, all that gear. Um, so yeah, I, and I always get a bit of a kick out of that. It's the kind of sometimes you you'll get a you get a funny name, Ariza Balaga. When it, look, I would have spent hours in the car chanting his name when I'm stuck <laughs> in traffic. You know, people are like, "What's the story with your man?" Looking at you from the other side of the glass, um, and then you fall over and or it or you forget your own name or which has happened to me a couple of times. Only it's written down. I'd, I'd sometimes I forget the guest's name, especially when we have uh, two, no, and yeah. it's just I blank. Yeah, sometimes when completely. I'm choosing the show, it's like oh, I'm joined by my calls. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. Greg, call him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, mix them up. No, it's just you have it's what, a brain fart actually. Yeah, um, that's it. <laughs> Greg, just, Greg says um, live. We're going live yeah. from and every we're not time. Live. Yeah, every it's time. because yeah. we used to like we started off doing a radio show on mm. DCUFM, mm. and then we just kind of just the format of it kind of changed, and and we went with the podcast. Yeah. So I'm just used to always going. You know, we're live here from the DCUFM. It's nice to say you know we're live. Yeah, it feels, yeah, yeah. Well, we are live at the moment. <laughs> yeah, technically, won't be, you won't be won't listening to this. Yeah, live. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is twenty twenty four after all, or something. Um, no, but like it, it, it's I, it's a great medium. Um, and like the I, like radio will always be. If that's where you start, that'll be your first mm-hmm. love because it's much more personal, personable, and personal. Um, like I hear James Richardson on one of the podcasts I listen to a lot, Totally Football, and he's a brilliant journalist and a great broadcaster. And he always says, and he does it sort of jokingly, but it is true. Hello, listener. That's the way he starts. Yeah. Um, and he, he constantly addresses the listener on the way through because, you know, if you're listening on your own or you're, you know, you have your headphones in, it's just you. Mm-hmm. There's not like 100,000 people. Let's all sit down in Crow Park here now. Although 80, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, I, it's just to that person. And when you're listening, you want to feel that person's talking to you, not to him or her or the dog or the cat or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that's... I suppose, yeah, it does make that bit more personable. That was yeah. um, one of our good friends, um, Sean Carey, who's now a DJ for FM 104 and mm-hmm. LMFM. He came in to do a workshop with us, a radio workshop mm-hmm. uh, presenting. And one of the key things like uh, things that you have to do is address the listener as like as if they're the only one listening oh that's that's you exactly make, yeah you know make yeah. them feel like they're the only person in the world yeah you know? like you know hello world isn't going to work yeah. and you're going to go no i don't like that <laughs> because when people listen to you or look at you particularly they make judgments we all know i like him i like her i don't like and sometimes actually this man ian core no it was a man called tim o'connor who was the former head of sport in rte and when I started doing the telly, he said, you know, the radio is one thing. Um, he said, you're going to have to get your head around the fact that if there's 100 people watching you at any one time, 50 of them will want to marry you, adopt you, run away with you, you know, spend the next 100 years with you. And he said, the other 50 are going to want to kill you. And he said, there's no rhyme or reason for either. But he said, you're just going to have to get that into your head and try and deal with that and mm-hmm. I still haven't but um, <laughs> you know it, it's amazing though but we all know I like like say with Gary Lineker mm-hmm. you know and I really like him and I think he's like I, I he's remember him, I remember him playing I know but like, uh, like he, he has done extraordinarily well um, out of you know like winning the golden boot in Mexico in 1986 playing with Barcelona the Everton stuff Tottenham all of that um, and Leicester of course at the start and like look at him now and he's the number one sports broadcaster that the BBC have and he works for BT and sure divisive but like you know you might Greg feel that he's divisive or you, you're not sure about him but you can't maybe you can't really figure out why yeah you yeah. know um, so it's, it's a very personal thing like the TV thing is bigger in terms of who you're broadcasting to and, and that's where it kind of loses the connection with you mm-hmm. because 
uh, or the, like that radio has because it's it's designed to be for a bigger audience. Yeah, yeah. sometimes we've, we've heard that from a lot of guests who, like Brian Dobson, for say, you know, yeah. he's known from being on the telly, but he yeah. prefers radio because yeah. it is more intimate. Yeah. Um, he feels a better connection. TV, there's so many moving parts, so many yeah. people working, you yeah. know. Um, so I guess just TV in general. Have you found that compared to radio? Oh yeah, like I just think I suppose when you say it, you don't. You do think about it at the time, but there could be, like let's say the Champions League thing we were doing last week, there was me and three others at the desk. Then you've got like four camera people. You've got the floor manager, the auto queue, lighting, you know, even down to the air conditioning. Then you have the people in the control room, the director, the BCO, the AP, all of that stuff, the graphics people. There'll be 50 people working on that program. Then the researchers behind the scenes and, you know, all people at home sitting, is look, they, they see you there. Um, and the other three, if it's a Champions League night or whatever, but it's just kind of, it's so so much bigger. Um, and there's a, like, listen, even the years I'm doing it, there's loads of bits of it I still don't understand, and maybe I don't want it. <laughs> Have there um, been uh, any nights where it's just been complete chaos? Oh, all the time. Well, actually, yeah. The, yeah. Well, when you have Dunphy on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, no, look, they're all, like some of the Olympic stuff we did, um, and even that, the European Athletics Championships last year, which became a bigger thing than just athletics, but... Like, you know, there was one of the Olympics nights I remember being on. I was doing the, the time difference was a bit skewy that a lot of stuff happened, you know, in the early hours of yeah, the morning and, and, and the, the athletics. Like Peter Collins would come on after me and he'd be on till three in the morning. I remember, though, the day of the Olympic soccer final, which like after the disaster that Brazil had in the World Cup semi-final, the, the Olympic football tournament was huge for them. Mm -hmm. And like Neymar was playing and a few others. And, you know, he, he scored the winning penalty in the shootout, so you, you couldn't have written the thing better. And it was in the Maracanã and Rio and all the kind of magic that goes with that place. Um, but it, we, I, I was on, I was sitting in that studio for nine and a half hours. And I remember towards the end of it kind of going, oh my God, this is amazing. But Christ, I'm so tired. <laughs> it was like we were Red Bull and, you know, these stuff, you know, the... the kind of caffeine tablets and it was like oh my god you know and oh please don't go to penalties i actually <laughs> do you know so yeah no, there's chaos everywhere and you're you're listening to the editor in your ear the director producer all that sort of thing and you're is that actually to, something that you've ever struggled with you know someone talking in your ear as you're trying to speak yeah well no you get used to it okay. like i think like again you you'll be trying that here mm -hmm. you know where i suppose actually an easy way of doing it is if i'm talking to you and Colm's sitting here talking to somebody else. I'm listening to you, but I'm listening to his conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. as well. So, like, that's that's ex essentially what it is. Like, a colleague of mine who will remain nameless years ago, um, when he started doing sort of Sports Stadium or one of these programs, the editor spoke to him <clears throat> to give him an, uh, an instruction while he was reading out football scores or mm -hmm. horse racing or whatever. And this presenter went, you know, blah, 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 and the 2.30 at Haydock, blah. And his name was mentioned by the editor to give him this instruction. And he just went in the middle of it while he was reading out this stuff, yeah. And the editor just said to him afterwards, um, X, Y, Z, next time I call out your name, don't reply to me on air. Uh, sorry, that's funny because that story has been told by the person who committed that very error. Really? Yeah. Are you sure? Positive? Okay, we can edit this out. Yeah. 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 Told us that yeah, one. Edit that out, will you? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That, that person should remain well, nameless. No. But if you want to go back and listen, you'll yeah. find us. He did tell me. He did tell me. Maybe you should cut that whole bit out. But, um, <laughs> no, well, I suppose, and you could to an extent, because I suppose just in a broader sense, like it is, it, that is difficult, but you get, it, no, it's never easy, but it gets easier. Okay. And it is, you know, because you're trying really hard, or, you know, I suppose the really good editors, they'll know, like, you, you really don't want to be asking a very, intricate question while the person is saying to you listen Dara when, when you're done this will you bring Didi in and then go to an ad break mm -hmm. and two and two makes four and Lima is the capital of Peru and all of that stuff so you just don't want the kind of complicated stuff okay. the best time to give you that information is when you're not talking okay. and when you're listening and like what I say if I'm we've changed the seating position this year so I'm over the other side of the room whatever way that is but um, I used to have the earpiece in I if you're like columns beside me okay. I don't want the earpiece here I want to be able to hear what Ear you're rings, saying yeah. so yeah. I'll have it over here now people might see it and all that stuff and they don't like that but look whatever okay mm. so sorry you made the move to RT yeah. anyways yeah how was that was it was it hard to adapt or oh yeah that was the scariest thing ever um, I remember that the week I left because I really loved working in 104 and coming from like it was a very sort of small 
community I don't mean like it was a big setup and doing really well but like you know there were 50 of us that worked there and I knew the salespeople as much as I knew the cleaner and the receptionist and the newsreaders and all the DJs or the jocks as they like to be called um, I'm sorry I don't speak jock but um, you, you've, you know it was a really nice it was like a family mm-hmm. and then to leave that um, was really scary Okay. and I remember driving in because actually the week I left Oh, because I had I had a, a loan of a car from them at the time, okay. um, to which I used to kind of I wasn't long driving. But the week I left, I gave them back the car, left one hundred four, joined RTE, passed my driving test, and took out a car loan. <laughs> and I've that's been a busy in, yeah, week. I've been in debt ever since. But, um, <laughs> no, but I remember driving over, going, you know, and it's natural to have doubts about these things. But I was like, what on earth are you doing? You're not going to be able to do this, and all the the doubts that we all get and you still have and what are you doing you're muppet this is why didn't you just stay where you were you so, left your good shot you yeah, yeah yeah so we like it, it was scary um because i suppose i'd grown up listening to it like you know uh, when i was growing up there weren't as many stations about if you had an interest in sport you weren't going to get it you got it on the tv but you weren't going to get it on you know the other stations at the time the, the pirates yeah. because there was no value in them doing it so and i suppose like sports broadcasting at that time you know, 80s, late 70s, early 80s, like, you know, the only live soccer match you saw, you saw a few Ireland games, but you'd see the FA Cup final, Mm -hmm. you know, and there was no sort of live English soccer. There would be three o'clock on a Saturday, but, you know, the big occasions and the big things that we're used to seeing now nearly every day, um, they were were very much in their... Few and fire between... Yeah, like the World Cup was just unbelievable. It still is, but, you know, in terms of being able to see a live football match every day, Mm -hmm. we have that now all the time, but, um, you know, that was... that's. That's where that came from, and you know the the crappy pictures and the guy sounding like he was broadcasting from the moon, and you know <laughs> with those four wire things, all the technology is just so brilliant now. Although it's still the odd time does fail, mm-hmm. you know. Technology does yeah. like to do that. Yeah. So yeah, it was a scary thing, completely. Okay. Yeah. And was was there anyone in? Well, I suppose you, you had a bit of a base. You knew a couple of people in RT. I did, and actually, well, how I got in, like at the time, because. It is, you know, they had a very, I suppose they, when you look at it, it's the same now, but a very sort of settled roster of people. And another really great friend of mine, Tony O'Donoghue, mm-hmm. was... Um, Fun fact about Tony, he went to college with my mum. Really? Yeah. Um, he studied in UCC together. Okay. Shiny, Mike. Fun fact about Tony, he, I've got to tell him that, he'll love that. <laughs> um, he, uh, maybe I shouldn't investigate too much. Anyway, um, he, he uh, <laughs> you can, you'll definitely be editing that bit out. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you will. Oh, you can I take will. that and... <laughs> yeah. it's okay Ian Dempsey flirted with Gav's mom over the phone yeah. during oh, nice. mid-interview so uh, oh, yeah okay. you're off the hook okay yeah, um, no I didn't mean that <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's fine. take that well I curse now and you definitely <laughs> just mark the time what time oh yeah okay um, so uh, what were we saying yeah Tony O'Donoghue right um, who went to college in UCC as it happens um, Tony was in the radio centre he'd been working in uh, radio RT Cork came up to Dublin and at that time, so this is 1995, they, and this is how I got in, um, they uh, decided that they wanted to do some sport on the television news over the weekends and they needed somebody to do it, but they had no infrastructure, no setup, no knowledge. They didn't really want sport on the television news at that time. This Mm -hmm. is a long time ago, what, 24 years ago, whatever. Um, So they asked Tony to do it. So then a slot became available. And then I was told, if you want to apply for this thing now, do. So that that was it. So yeah, we did like God it was um it was good fun there. Like again, like it's it's a smaller setup than television. You knew you're gonna hang around or be with the people you work with mm-hmm. more than anything else. So there was no sort of intermingling with uh, and I was kinda of too shy to be, oh, there's Gay Byrne or Marion Finucan <laughs> or Pat Kenny or whatever it was, you know. So um, yeah, I just kind of did my own thing, kept my head down. Okay. So when did the idea of television and presenting come calling? Um, the presenting much later. The TV commentary. The commentary is is like I kind of like a lot of these things. You start it by accident. Mm-hmm. Um, just sort of I go on do a bit of commentary there. Really, when you're over reporting at a match in UCD, and I was like, no, I can't. Oh no, do it. This is Ian Core. No, come on. I think you should do it. Try it. And I was like, no, go away. This, I never ever thought of myself as a commentator. Okay. I always loved listening to George and Jimmy and Barry Davies and John Motson and Jer Canning and all of those. Um, you know, Marty later then where they God, they can do this is an incredible skill that they have. I couldn't do that. So I didn't want to do it. And I was very resistant to it initially. And he said, No, just go on, try it and see how it goes. And I just started doing radio commentaries on League of Ireland matches. Um and 
the Champions League used to be one night a week when it was a much smaller competition. Like it started in 92, 93. And even if you looked at the structure of it now and tried to make sense of it, you'd go, how, how did Leeds were in it and Stuttgart? And, you know, it just was really strange. But there's much more structure on it now. But in 99, it went to two nights a week. 99, 2000. Uh, it was the year, it would have been the September after Man United it's won it. Yeah. Um, and they decided to bulk it up to whatever, 24 teams. So it was then Tuesday and Wednesday. So they needed another commentator. Jimmy McGee had had his, uh, the late great Jimmy had had his um, heart bypass thing. And there was two elements to this. They were doing a premiership every Saturday and there was the Champions League thing. So they needed another commentator. So myself, Con Murphy, and somebody else who I can't remember, and I probably shouldn't name. No, I can remember, but I'm not going to give you his name. The three of us went for the, because uh, it's not fair, um, the three of us went for these, these uh, commentary auditions. Okay. And uh, I got it, Crazy. which is weird to kind of beat Con to something uh, when we were kind of competing against each other. So that's where that started. And I went in there as a commentator and a reporter, never as a presenter. And I had never, no inclination, didn't want to do, excuse me, the TV stuff at all. Just commentary, let's go. That's but you know, it's the nearest thing. No, I never played at that level, but the nearest thing to actually being involved in a match that way that you're at the game and you're in it. You're, you're as close as you can venue. possibly be. And that's what I still love there. about it. Like, and I kind of at the moment now, I've it feeds both addictions that I have. I, I can relate a bit. Uh, I, I hurt my knee while I was young enough, yeah. um, and I couldn't go back playing. Mm. And I started doing a bit of refereeing, yeah. then I went on, and I did a bit of coaching, and then naturally enough. I went to a local newspaper yeah. and I've been there since and yeah. it's as close as I can get without actually playing yeah. and I love it oh, you know it just no. brought you to the Crow Park, Crow Park Press yeah I, I got my debut in the Crow Park Press Box uh, last summer um, yeah. after it only took me nine years of freelance just sports journalism to get there keep but, uh, knocking on that door yeah well actually I don't want to go back I did the Leash yeah. and Loud game three weeks ago or th- right. three weeks ago four weeks ago and um, it was apps. It was the first of a triple header. Yeah. Remember then the double ladies. Oh, this was the one at twelve o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was three. O'clock. Oh, Ross played in that. He did. Yeah. He scored one six. Yeah. Uh, rolled back the years for a thirty-six. Yeah, yeah. Man, Ross. Yeah, he's only a kid. Um, <laughs> but I was absolutely freezing. Yeah. I, I met my dad no. down in Jones's Road, and I was shaking. If it, do you know what? In July, it could be thirty degrees, but you're up on the seventh floor there. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what. Like I've gone in there in the summer with you know hats, gloves. Mm-hmm. Big heavy coats. I always bring another coat with me. You could go in a shirt. I was warned. My editor said in the email, yeah. he was like, now you've been there during summer. Winter is a different story. Yeah. There's another kind of fun fact. Uh, well, not fun fact. Top tip, actually. Okay. Um, you know, I, I'll bring all sorts of rubbish with me um, to matches. But it's not rubbish if you need it. So I'd, I'd rather be looking at it than looking for it. So okay. if you need two coats, bring them. You, you, you can end up carrying them around for the day. Mm-hmm. But that's just... The first time I, I actually... it was. The Leash and Carlo Leinster semi final last mm. year was my first one, and, and uh, I sat down at the ones with you know the TV. So for the yeah. broadcasting, yeah. I was swiftly moved out of there. Oh yeah, yeah, and, be, yeah. and rightly so. Oh yeah, like, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, no. you could not imagine the looks I got yeah. going up. Are, are you sure you're you're going up here? Are you yeah. not lost now? Yeah, yeah. If I didn't have the press pass, like it was just game over. I know. Go and let me through the place. It, it's, it can be intimidating. So when did mm. presenting present itself Presenti- to you? Uh, well, they, I started doing a bit of it, um, just sort of by, actually when I was, to go back a little bit, when I was in radio, um, I got a call one day to do a League of Ireland match between Sligo and Shamrock Rovers in the showground. Somebody somebody was sick. Ger was doing the commentary, and I don't know who was due to present at the time, but couldn't. And... That Tim O'Connor rang me and said I'd like you to do this thing and I was like Tim no I don't want to do it I'm how not. much notice did you have now? I don't know maybe a few days okay. so I think you'd be nearly be better off um, last minute just yeah, yeah just stand in there will you and do that because I was really intimidated by it and I went to my boss and I said look they want me to, to in radio they want me to do this and he's like I think you should do it and I was like I don't want to do it I need an excuse to get out of it <laughs> can I pretend I'm sick and this, you know <laughs> send me down to court for I've never week. been I was terrified. I really was terrified and stood there like, uh, I, I, the tape is at home somewhere. I've never looked at it. You know, have a look at it to, to learn something. No, because you can never be that bad again. Retirement day. I'm yeah, sure you yeah, break it yeah. out. My hands shaking and all that stuff. So it was, it was really intimidating. And it just, I suppose it just like a lot of these things that happened by accident. Um, I think Bill, uh, Bill O'Hurley, the late great, 
uh, like Jimmy, but Bill wanted to kind of pull back a little bit. This is 06, 07, mm-hmm. and I was still, all I was doing was commentating and reporting. The GA had come into it a bit as well, um, which initially started off really badly. Okay. Uh, because I was doing, you know, like a soccer match has a rhythm to it, <laughs> and you really don't need to be describing everything, and mm-hmm. it's, it's one of the old faults, and look, I've spent years trying to get rid of it. Radio TV, radio commentary, TV commentary, how you know that one is really descriptive and the other one you're you're just an aid to people watching it mm-hmm. at home yeah. so um i was still in the habit of saying right foot left foot right yeah, hand yeah. left all that stuff um and i uh sorry what was it? go back to i'm talking really i'm talking crap now i'm losing my my train of thought but no um did the we we, we did the commentary bit Bill wanted to take a back seat. Will you do a bit of this? And I was like, no, I don't want to do it. I think I did the Confederations Cup in 05. Okay. Just to see, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it wasn't as terrifying as it had been before. It still it still was really ordinary. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just, like, I started doing the Premiership regularly. Bill um, was very busy with his other business. And then there was loads of live soccer, two nights of Champions League, Ireland games. Bang, 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 and he just didn't need the Saturday thing. So that's where that started. Okay. You know? So that that's where that began. Premier Soccer Saturday. Well, I don't remember it as the Premiership. Yeah, it started as the Premiership, Premiership, which was yeah. and like it was Bill and John and Eamon. Mm-hmm. And like it started in like I started work doing voiceovers for them like ninety eight, so a year before the T V thing happened. And it was just you go over, get the pick again, it gave me another skill to be able to take, you know, watch the whole game sub it down to a minute and then do the voiceover that tri- that you tried to get it to fit um, so again that didn't always work but yeah so that that was like it was hugely popular at the time mm-hmm. I said it's funny because it's gone since 2013 there was an article on balls.ie the other day talking about why people still miss it and I was like oh you know <laughs> anyway six years later and yeah, so Darryl, it's a big ask when you started presenting how did yeah. you change your preparation for shows I, I'd still is it much different from TV to radio? I suppose. Well, you, you just... There's still a, lot, a massive amount of preparation. Like, say, with a... You know, like, with some of the, the GA matches that we do. Um, I've won now Kerry and... Kerry... Is it Kerry Mayo? It is Kerry Mayo in a couple of weeks on the 16th. And you, you've started, like... What are we... What date is today? The 27th so. of Feb. And I was, we started prepping for that already mm-hmm. at Castle Bar this weekend, um, doing Mayo's game. So... You know, you're always building up bits and pieces that will help with that. You could do 20 hours of um, prep for a, a GA match. Mm-hmm. You know, you have 60 players essentially, and you need to have, you know, what club, what age, what, just something your, different what, about them. What, like, how does that look like? Because obviously, for soccer, it's way more accessible to get that type of information. Mm. Um, in the GA, what, where's your where's your goal? The GA has become well, it's become better. Like, you get great stuff from the PROs in each of the county boards. They give you a lot of those things. One, one of the, the most sort of sluggish bits of it is trying to work out when somebody was born, because you'll get, you know, it'll give you 1989. Now, hang on, what, is that 30 or is he 29? Or, uh, <laughs> and you, that's one of the, 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 if a PRO would give you stuff that just said he's 30, mm-hmm. right, love it, mm-hmm. um, or he's 25. No, you, you, all those bits, it, that has become uh, much better. It's like all the, you know, the don't fail stuff on Twitter mm-hmm. and you, you We've access to much more information about the GA that we had maybe five years ago. The soccer stuff has always been easier, um, you know, particularly with the internet, but go back maybe 10 years. There's a, every year, every uh, start of every season, there's a book called The Rothmans Football oh, Book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's, it's six An inches thick. Oh, yeah, but it'll give you everything and all the bits and where they've played. So we, I used to carry that with like It's a heavy <laughs> LDO. You'd bring it every Saturday over to premiership matches when we used to travel. Um, so, you know, it, it's become a lot... The, the, a lot more accessible what I will try and do like let's say with Kerry and Mayo and again I can't I definitely can't tell you who they are I've, I've somebody in each county okay. who I'll ring mm-hmm. and I'll say they're not connected with the team or maybe they might be just on the fringes and I'll just say look can you give me an idea how Joe is playing how mm-hmm. Mick is playing what they're doing is there something different that's changed with them this year and they'll just give you to quick your phrase a fun fact about them which you <laughs> hope is relevant and like you know with all of those things you'll you'll only use 10 percent of it okay like there's 90 percent of it that just goes in the bin but that's you use it for the, or you'll at least you have a starting point when you're doing them the next day mm-hmm. um if if they're going to have a bit of a future so um, similar yeah similar to that when i uh when i started working the local newspaper mm. 
instead of I was, so I was, I'd go to matches as well, but I also had to do like roundups. So I yeah. had to do maybe do four or five matches at once. Yeah. So I used to have to ring around to the different clubs and say, "Hey, you know, we're yeah. at the game." Yeah. I could go through a full committee of a GA club. Not one of them would even know that the club were playing the day before. Yeah, no. You know. Yeah. yeah, the soccer, like, you know, all that information's out there, but the GA is catching up pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Um, even just with stuff about past meetings, like the GA themselves in championship season bring out a kind of a, a pretty good information pack mm-hmm. about each weekend. Excuse me. And, like, you know, it'll give you past history and, you know, how many times they met and bits and pieces. And then the, the papers are at the start of, say, the championship will have all their supplements, the examiner, the previews, and, the and, and, yeah. and they're great. Even just little things like, you know, Liam Sheedy, you know, first year, second term mm-hmm. kind of stuff, yeah. you know. Um, you'd, like, you'd know that, but it's just nice to have confirmation of it. Um, this is a question that we brought up with Michael Lester when we yeah. visited him down in RTE. Um, obviously, the show, whether it be it a live Champions League game or whatever, mm-hmm. um, it's about the game, but it's also like you're there to entertain the viewers, certainly to uh, some extent. And a lot of entertainment comes from the characters you'd have on the panel. Yeah. Now, we spoke to Michael about this with regards to the likes of, let's say, Joe Brawley. Like, how far can you let him push the ball before yeah. you kind of have to rope him back in? Is that a challenge you found in yours? Now, I'm not going to allude to anybody. People can ah, yeah, make no, up their own uh, minds. But. Yeah, no, look, it is. But but that's, listen, that's part of why you're there. And, you know, some, I have to be honest, you kind of, there's times when you, you're stuck in the middle of something and like you're not necessarily thinking about is this entertaining you're thinking about hang on I've got to do my job properly mm-hmm. here I've got to make sure that you know if it does go to a place and it's happened to me a few times where you're kind of thinking legal stuff um, that you've got to make sure that you've got all your ducks in a row and you've done as much as you can to diffuse it or contain it or whatever like you know I, I think and, and those things only happen very rarely but they're, they're like you know your first port of call like say listen it's not an entertaining um you know i i had a couple of incidents with with some high profile panelists where it just went into orbit um and continued after during and after and all that sort of thing so um look that's that's part of why we're there and mm-hmm. you hope at the time when you need it that your training and what you learned and your experience and all of those things will will kick in when you need them. Have it's you ever had a, no guarantee. a a kiss and make up moment with, with amongst the lads or anything? What is it, a pint afterwards? No, 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 not really. Okay. No, no like what you saw and what you see is real. There's nothing okay. contrived about it. There's nobody, you know, ah, that was great and, you know, uh, I want to be the shock jock thing or mm-hmm. whatever that phrase is. It's real, all of it. Okay. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, a, there's some I get on really well with. There's others who it's a professional relationship mm-hmm. and... You know, there's a distance there, and that's absolutely fine. I've no problem with that. Any part, of, just part of life. Isn't yeah, it? that's You're it. Like people you get on, like say Damien Duff, I've become really f- close with, a very friendly mm-hmm. with, and um, like again, I you know watched him for years. Always thought he was a an amazing player, and um, we're lucky to have him on board. So yeah, I get on really well with with Damien and Richie and Dee Dee, and you know we're lucky with the kind of talent pool that we have, and it's changing, it's morphing, and mm-hmm. you know it's it's kind of moving on. Um, you talked about you were head of sport in mm. FM 104 for a brief period of time now has the job of head of sport in RT ever been A offered or B of interest to you? No to be honest no um, and, and and like I said we were really lucky with our new head of sport Declan McBennett we were very lucky with Ryle before him and Glenn and Niall Cogley these are all great people um, and it, it's, I loved working for them all and I know I'm going to love working for Declan um, I do already but um no, it's that's not me at all. I have to say, I, like, do you know? It, it's people might say, oh, you, oh, you should go for that thing. And no, I'm, I've enough trouble. First of all, looking after myself um, and trying to keep myself uh, on the straight and narrow and all that stuff. But th- there's a large element of that. Like I've no, even in terms of kind of aptitude for it, I've no experience of you know running an away team at a World Cup or you know running the home team. Um, at, at an Olympic Games which is a massive operation you know like 20 hours of TV a day for 16 days in a row um, all the panellists all the presenters all the editors the shot listers the you know the VT editors it's a massive operation it really is huge it's mind blowing so you know I, it, just to say oh yeah your man would be good at the head of sport just because somebody knows what is his name outside absolutely not I wouldn't it's never been offered to me um, I wasn't interested in applying for it the last time because 
there are so many other people who would be so much better than I am with it. Um, and you know, I'd probably want completely unrealistic things for it as well. Um, and we have to be realistic about where you know uh, the, the the broadcasting market at the moment, how it's changed, how um, the the amount of competition that's out there with Virgin, with Premier Sports, with Sky, particularly you know BBC. Um, 11 sports you see what's happening yeah. with that at the moment and it's kind of it's in I've a, seen BBC or is it BBC or ITV, ITV. Picked, up, picked up the yeah, La Liga yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. Like, like they you know, the guy who set up BT Sport went to help with oh, 11 okay. I think 11 is big in Portugal and Spain mm-hmm. um, but you know it's, it's a really competitive market and um, you know the, the money that's involved with some of these things like BT paying a billion pound sterling for the, the Champions League mm-hmm. and the Europa League oh my god you know um, so listen, fair play. They have that money, and it's their product um, in the UK, and and you know it's it's we've got to find a way to sort of slot in with all those things, you know. So Dara, try your yeah. career. Uh, standout moments, standout tournaments. Oh God, um, good lord! I I was only talking about somebody yes about it to somebody yesterday. Ninety eight, the European Under eighteen Championships in Cyprus, which we won. Okay. Robbie Keane was playing. Duffer was injured. Uh, Richard Dunn played. Uh, Richie Partridge. We won the European Under Eighteen mm-hmm. Championship earlier that year. We'd won the Under Sixteens with John O'Shea and Andy Reid and um, Shane Barrett and all these guys. Um, or Graham Barrett, excuse me. Um, we were the champions of Europe, um, and we did those, those things. It was a bit of a punt at the time because. The F- UEFA underage tournaments, so again, they're big news now, but the back then, in terms of the media coverage, it wasn't that big. Mm-hmm. So I went out there on my own at Forty Radio and did... Out the, to Cyprus. Yeah. Well, no, there was a few, good few journalists there, but we, d- we broadcast all four matches live, and I did the entire commentary on all four of them uh, on my own. And the final went to penalties. It was played in 42 degrees of heat in Larnaca, and we beat Germany on penalties in a European Championship final. So that's a biggie. Um... That's one that I, I, I really cherish. Look, look, all the Ga ones I've, I've done, I've been really fortunate after Michal Omer Hertig retired, uh, really fortunate to do the last, how many finals? <laughs> the All-Ireland finals, seven of them and replays and things like that on radio. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've really enjoyed those. Um, you know, like, ah, TV-wise, um, I'm just trying to think, it kind of put me on the spot a bit. So the Ga, I get to do the GA on the telly, the f- finals are on the radio. Um, How did you find the World Cup last year? Because I know a lot of people said that the last World Cup in Russia was one of the best ever. Yeah, I know, and, and look, the people were very positive about Brazil as well. I, I, O2 was the first World Cup I went to as a commentator. And again, if you'd put this in front of me and said, do you want to go to the World Cup as a commentator or be a presenter? Like the first one I actually didn't go to. I went to O2 and O6. I've been at three European Championships. The last one was um, in O8. Um, like I've never seen Ireland play a, a major championship finals oh, match live. Yeah. No, I, I covered them in. Um, I've covered them here and there, but uh, and like I say, the, the last Euros and stuff. Uh, but I've never actually been there when our team have walked out. Like in in O two, George started the World Cup in in Japan, and I started in Korea. Now I got like I was with France and Brazil, and it was amazing. And I, I was there until, no, we, we swapped then. Ireland went to Suwon in Korea and lost to Spain on penalties. And I jumped across and did Brazil, Belgium in, where the hell was that? Kobe, I think, in Japan. So I did the two World Cups. 06 was, I probably, I was, a, I hope, like to think I was more comfortable as a commentator in 06. And I had, you know, co-coms with me. I had Giles with me and Trevor Stephen in 06. Loved it. We did all the way up to the semi-final. Uh, the semi-final was funny in 06. Um, it was Oh, Italy and Germany, which was mega. It was yeah. in Dortmund, and you know, set what? What does? I don't think it was set up at the 80,000 configuration. They had seats, but Maradona's behind us smoking a big Cuban cigar, <laughs> and we're doing the commentary. And Diego was given, and he all security guy, and he literally is like he's a tiny little fella, five foot five or something. And it was not like I, I used to smoke, and I was dying for a smoke. And there's your mom with this big Fidel Castro Cuban cigar, uh, and nobody was coming near Diego to tell him to put out that cigar. <laughs> But um, yeah, Italy won at late. I think Del Piero and Gross. I think Grosso scored the goal. That kind of it was Klinsmann's Germany and all of that sort of stuff. But yeah, oh six was Brill. Oh two, I got to go to the final, which mm-hmm. was amazing. So actually, I wasn't working on it. I was just sitting there yes. watching it. They, they, I extended my. I was to be there to the semi final on the Thursday, 
and I said, "Ah, oh, here, effectively, we'll stay till the final on Sunday, change the flights and all that stuff." So yeah, listen, you know, any any of the games that you're always drawn to the big occasions and the big the bigger like UEFA Cup finals and bits and FAI Cup finals. Um, they're all huge. I suppose in, in the studio, Casey winning her gold in London. I, it's, again, it's just the way it fell. They, you know, Bill used to do all the nighttime shows because he was the number one guy. I did the middle ones. And whatever way Casey's final, it just fell. To, and to see her do that, having you know, known her for years, seeing her trying to get the recognition that she deserved, and that was, that was pretty cool. We were actually, um, I can't remember where we were on. I think we were on the way back from Kerry uh, when the, uh, fight, the final was on. And it was we were, Marty commentating on it? It was on the radio. It was yeah. We were listening yeah. to it on the radio, yeah. and Dad was getting so into it that he pulled in the car and sprinted yeah. in. There was a there was a pub on the yeah. other side. Road. He sprinted in just so he could watch it, and he got yeah. the like last moments of it. When me and my mum were just sitting in the yeah. car, like because at the end of it, it wasn't at all certain that she'd won it. Yeah. Mm. You know, I, actually, I suppose the Ireland games, Ireland Italy at the Euros was huge. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just to, and even Ireland France and like we were leading at half time. You know. Yeah. Um, and only only Deschamps yeah. brought Kante on, wasn't it? Um, and okay, Duffy had been sent off and all of that stuff. So yeah, that's when um, Griezmann did his little dance. Yeah, he was pretty cool. Um, and Paul, what's his name? Paul. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm joking. Paul, Paul, Paul. Uh, everybody knows him. But no, like, oh, it, it's hard to when you sit down. The the bits that jump out at you um, are those. But I'm sure there's a load of others that I'll think about in the car on the way home. Would you be one for memorabilia? Yeah, massive. Oh, okay, go on. I'm interested. I know I'm a shocker, Anorak. Um, I collect. Um, I've got all the World Cup footballs okay. from 1982. I started buying them. Okay. They had a couple of them. I got a pal of mine who used to work with Adidas gave me the, it's called the Fever Nova. They all have names. Uh, you're all going to leave now and I'm going to be left here no. talking to my own. Um, what, what was the, um, the, the O2 one? And it was a match ball. So they're not like, you know, I bought, I, I got. They're actually like fairly expensive. You no, ever they actually are. buy the real the ones. The official ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, they're the ones. But I, the last one, and you'd probably say, Maloney, you'd lunatic. I paid 75 quid for the match ball from Russia. Okay. But it was, they're normally 150. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the older ones are cheaper, mm-hmm. you know. So Fair 82 right. was the first World Cup I properly remember. Mm-hmm. Um, that's 1982. Just, it was just for Spain. reference. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah Italy won it and Tardelli scored his goal in it and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, th- that's that's a bit. Of, and Jer, I'm an awful uh, jerseys now. I okay, jerseys now now you on. have me. Yeah. Did you know Ross has kept every championship jersey really? he's ever? Yeah. And has he washed them and everything? I didn't ask that now. I did ask if we could have a look at the collection, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I got a he's firm never no. Never given me a leash jersey. It's because he keeps them. Does he? He never. So that's seventy something. I think he told. I think he told us he swapped one in all of that. Yeah. In all of it. Yeah. yeah. I I've one for you now actually. Um and I'd be into I just the, the kind of match worn shirts are a mm-hmm. big thing. Now I've never bought any of them um because they're ridiculous money. If you go on to some of those websites yeah, and yeah. you you know like uh, Maradona looked at it. Oh that's 10 <laughs> grand, you know, and it's in a case. So I got a, I'm big into the Lions, the rugby, okay. so I've got a few um again through a pal of mine in Adidas when they used to make the kit. I have a couple of um match worn uh Lions jerseys oh, signed, cool. so the whole squad. You can't oh, make sure, out the I'm signatures. fairly sure they have the, yeah, they the embroidery yeah. of the, yeah. the game it was, and everything. they absolutely do. So I have two of those framed at home. I actually got, I did um, 2013 the uh, Dublin. They're all Ireland medals night, yeah. and uh, it was a huge honour for me to be asked to do it. I have to say, I haven't been asked back since, but anyway, um, they're, they're, it's a finely oiled machine now at this stage. Um, but they, the whole squad that night has thank you for me doing the thing for them. Um, signed a jersey and oh, have that framed at home absolutely. so that's a really cool thing um, to have like the Dublin management saying thank you to you <laughs> with that so and I, th- this year well, it's, it's from last year because I live in Mead um, and Sean Cox uh, from Dunboyne mm-hmm. who was injured at the Liverpool match yeah. I know Sean and I know him through the GA through my kind of past involvement with our, our club at home and I've just as a favour I've done a couple of nights for them the mm-hmm. player of the year thing so Dunboyne last year won the uh, Meath County title mm-hmm. and uh, Sean's son was on the team and we had the thing, it was like two nights before Christmas, it was a tough sell at home, where are you going? <laughs> Dunboyne Castle. But they, they, the, the Dunboyne team got a special set of jerseys made for the county final. Okay. So it had, you know... Um, Mead Senior County Final 2018 on it, and they gave me one. Now it was oh. number. I was I was joking because I was doing the MC thing at it. I said, "Oh, you got my playing number as well uh, from when I played with Vincent years ago." It was number 33. <laughs> uh, so it was like, "Hang on, that's the run the run to the litter down there," you know. But uh, no, I, it's I, I 
it's uh, one of them uh, match fit ones as well. Yeah, so it's a, very a few more days in the gym. Quite tight. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it might go on a frame. It could be less embarrassing. <laughs> but it's a really nice thing. So I'd be I'd be very into that That's stuff. Cool. You know? Yeah. And would you keep the likes of your match day program? I know I'm ridiculous. There's I, murder I, at I home. I do that. Like I, when I go now, when my dad was alive, any match I went to, it didn't matter what it was. He'd say, "Get me a program." So I'd come back with like three. I'd have one for me. Like I normally with the the match program particularly, like I'll have all my notes done. But with a GA match. I'll open the middle page mm-hmm. and I'll start scribbling all over it and I'll have highlighter pens and it looks like the, somebody put it up on we were t- doing it the lads on the website in work were doing a piece one day about how many changes there are you know nowadays in matches yeah. and a picture of my program is there and I think there's like eight changes on the Dublin team <laughs> and seven on the Monaghan one or something so the first one is useless it's for the bin then I want a clean one because ca- you would get some good stuff in yeah, it that you yeah. need again but yeah, no, I have a house full of match programs. It's, it's not, uh, well, it's good for me, but not good for anybody else in the rest <laughs> of the house, you know? Lighter side, I suppose. You will go to the lighter side. Yeah. Um, I suppose, firstly, mm. favourite, I'm going to say favourite grounds, stadium grounds. Whoa. I couldn't. My I'll, I'll limit it to three. Three of your... Three? Yeah. Oh, fiddlesticks. Um, that's really hard. Like, look, Crow Park and the Aviva... You know, like Croke Park, how many miles is it from here, yeah. from where we're sitting? And it's like the fourth biggest stadium in Europe, and you get to, that's your office when you're in there every day. Um, the foreign ones, like uh, the, the, you know, um, Luzhniki in Moscow, uh, We George Hamilton was sick at the time, and I, I went back to commentate on a few games, us in the playoff against Estonia, but the Richard Dunn match. Oh yeah, of George was taken very ill very quickly, and they were like, we need a commentator, and I hadn't commentated on soccer in five years or okay. something, and somebody go and do it, I was like, oh yeah, I was terrified. But the Luzhniki was brilliant, and we got a great result there that night. Um, that was That's a cool place. Ah, look, you know, the new camp, any of those places, the San Siro, again, because the World Cup in 1990, Ireland were there, we didn't get to play there, but just this place looked like this, you know, it was colossal, and okay. I got to do stuff there. So I, it does, they're all brilliant. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, okay, well, I Wembley, have, the old Wembley was brilliant. I have them for you then. Go on. Is there any grounds that you hated? Oh. Do you really think I'm going to tell you that? Oh, I'll definitely. tell you one thing. No, okay. Off I remember from years ago. I, do, I've do, I actually have done. I did um, Wicklow beating down in Ockram. <laughs> I think it was was it Tony Hannan? It was the, the centre forward. Um, that was a brilliant day actually because. P, um, Mikko was managing Wicklow mm-hmm. and Ross Carr, who I really like, he's a lovely man, a brilliant player, and he was the manager of Down, and it was a, re- a huge shock. There was one day I remember doing a match, I'm not going to tell you where it is, because it's, it's still an active ground, they <laughs> okay. updated it slightly, but I remember doing a match one day, I was in FM 104, and Con was in RTE, and he brought me to this game, it was outside of Leinster, let's okay. say, and we did the match, it was an FAI Cup match, so it's a League of Ireland ground, and we did the match that day in the the gardener or the groundsman's shed at the bottom of the pitch the roof leaked all our notes got wrecked Con had one of these old the, the, the mobile phones when you look at them now they used to be the size of yeah. a, a school bag and when, when you dial the number the whole ground heard it because it was this <laughs> loudest beep so no look you know listen everybody's doing their best and uh, when there isn't a lot of money around as long as the pitch is good and people are comfortable when they're in it every ground is that's a real political answer, isn't it? <laughs> Every ground is lovely. Yeah. If we if this was Dave McCullough you were sitting in front of now, we might press you a bit more. Yeah, no, we'll, it's fine. We'll, we'll let you away with yeah, it. Yeah, no, go on. Uh, tea or coffee? Coffee, all day. How do you take your coffee? Black. Just black? Yep. Mm. Americano. Okay. Really, very strong. Hardcore. Yeah. And um, would you like yeah. to hear our answer from yesterday, just because it was quite interesting. So it was Keith Walsh from Breakfast oh, yeah. Republic. Oh, yeah. He takes a decaffeinated tea really? with oat milk. Okay. No sugar, because he, he's ah, off the sugar. Is he off yeah, the sugar? Yeah. He's also up very early as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Keith was involved in one of the Celebrity Fittest Family we did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe he should have coffee. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Keith. But uh, no, listen, fair play. Oat milk, good luck. Oh, that yeah, sounds happy terrible. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll have a Red Bull then after. <laughs> no. uh, Dara, where do you see the Champions League ending up this season? Mm. We have, uh, I really don't know. Yeah. Um, 
God, like maybe PSG, maybe Man United. I really don't know. I don't. Real Madrid are a bit of a mess, but they've mm. been a mess over the last few years and yeah. won the damn thing. Atletico have really put their name in the hat. After Atletico, the brilliant. Um, and I love Simeone. He's a mm. complete lunatic. Um, and you know, it's all good managers. Should yes, be. they should be. Yes, he's definitely unhinged. Um, but I, I really don't know. Like, could, could it be City going to win all four? You just like they've the squad to kind of take that on, even though they probably shouldn't have won on Sunday. Um, no. at all but I, I am a Chelsea supporter so I don't, yeah. I don't want to talk about Sunday I know I, that's why you're winced when I said Ariza Balag yeah. Yeah. yeah should he be should he be fired would you get rid of him I thought he I think he it did. was absolutely disgraceful if it came down between him and Sari though I think he'd, they'd go with him because well, he's their most expensive player he's the most expensive history. goalkeeper most in the world mm. goalkeeper in 71 million the only thing I just felt like and I know Sari's thing has gone wrong but I just felt really sorry for the chat. I'd me. like to. I'd love to have seen Caballero having saved three penalties when City won the League Cup. Mm. I'd love to have seen him with the City player because, like, to me, the penalties, the mind game stuff is huge. Yeah. yeah. And like, it's all you know. You, you, I don't know if you've ever been in those kind of situations, but I'm sure those players when they walk up, I know they're professionals, but you know they can't walk. You talk to Ray Houghton and Cascarino after uh, Genoa, like you, one foot in front of the other is hard when the mm. world is watching you. Or when, like, like say Wembley, you have one hundred and sixty thousand eyes looking at you. Forget the people on the TV, eighty by yeah. two. But you know, like they're all trained on you. And Caballero is a penalty specialist. His record is much better than your man's. I just thought your man lost the plot. When they went to penalties, Aguero took a weak penalty and just went. And he should have saved. Yeah, yeah, no, I thought that was awful. Um. So yeah. Anyway, I'm there agreed. you go. But uh, Colin is a big Liverpool fan, so I have to ask. Yeah. Are they going to bottle it? Um. They either will bottle it or they won't. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'd be like, look, 29 years. Uh, I remember it. Your parents probably don't even remember it. Um, no, but I just find it amazing. Like for a club of that size, and Man United, okay, it's maybe stabilised a bit. They're starting to make all the same mistakes that Liverpool did yeah. after they won it the last time. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I hear, you know... Eamon and those guys talking, Didi Haman. There is tension there. There has to be tension there. Absolutely. Of course there is. I, I only, last night, because we were um, at a match on Sunday, and I only saw the Liverpool Man United game the other night, or last night. And, like, the something, okay, Firmino going off is a big thing. He, Klopp's thing about, you know, oh, when the three substitutions, we lost our rhythm. Um, I heard somebody say, hang on a minute, he turned a positive into a negative. He, he's in that. Uh, why would three man U- weakening Man United's team yeah. make Liverpool lose their rhythm? I th- do you know what? Look, they're just going to get they'll get through it. It's it's like City aren't going to win all four, but I'd just be worried about. Uh, Klopp is the big Klopp has the big job to do now to calm it all down. Of course, and like even the little thing with Henderson on Sunday was weird. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, you didn't shake my hand. Uh, what do you want? Uh, I think Henderson, you know, was clapping and applauding the Liverpool fans who were there. Um, that uh, but like. That game's out of the way now. What have they got? Tottenham? Well, and the rest... Well, Watford tonight. Yeah, 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 but the rest of it, like, yeah. you go, yeah, we win all those. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I don't think City will win every game. City have Man United as well. Yeah, and Tottenham. Um, and Tottenham. Um, and, Tottenham. Yeah. Uh, and Tottenham. So, like, there's only a point in it. I, I actually wouldn't, from a Liverpool point of view, I wouldn't mind... I think Liverpool might prefer to be chasing City. So even if they go behind, I wouldn't throw all the toys out of the pram yet, Colin. Um, I he has a tendency. Yeah. He has a tendency. I no, like I get. But why do you? Can, can you get? You, you're anxious about it, are you? I'm, I know. Like, see, in I think I'm quite good at in after the match. Once I've had a like, I'm quite high strung during a match, win, lose, or draw. And uh, no matter what happens, I can never really enjoy a Liverpool match until it's over. Until it's over. Won. But yeah. afterwards, I think I'm fairly good at kind of you know analyzing. Getting back on the bandwagon, yeah. Um, how is it a bandwagon, Greg? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Uh, no, but it's it's like there is. If you're tense about it and you can't watch the game, like imagine what it's like for the Liverpool players. I've been listening oh, yeah. to Gary Neville a lot. He's been talking about um, one of his podcasts, and he's been talking a lot about the tension that say the younger players felt. People tell Liverpool players, "I'll oh, go and enjoy this now." Yeah, they'll only enjoy it when they win it. It's yeah, like you, you'll yeah. only enjoy the match when it's over. Yeah. But everywhere they go, this is going to be in their faces. City have won it before, but like you know, you just got to go and. They've just got to go and win it for the first time. If Klopp can keep them, there's no point in being like it's February. What the hell are you being tense about now? But now, listen, that's easy for me to say because I'm not there and I'm not in the dressing room. And you know, when Firmino goes off, like Watford, actually tonight's a big game. If yeah. they can, if they can win, because Watford are good. 
Mm. Watford have been good. Oh, they've been fantastic. Um, season, yeah. So th- that's not. A, is that Anfield though, isn't it? It is. But I think this, the the players are feeding off the tension in the ground Certainly from the Liverpool mean. fans because yeah. it's just such a long time. Yeah, Salah like, did score four goals against them last year, so I'm hoping for against repeat, Watford. Against Watford at home yeah. last year, so I'm hoping for a repeat performance. I know. Have you been over? Do you go over? To Anfield? Yeah. Um, not as much as I'd like. I've only ever been over twice. I, like I say to my dad every year, this year we'll go to yeah. at least one over at Anfield. Yeah. I think we, it always just kind of slips our mind. Uh, it's, it's hard to... It's also the, the, the tickets. Well. Yeah, yeah, well, the tickets, the tickets are very hard to get. Yeah. Um, like, I got the... Pa- I can't remember these. Are we still recording this? Um, <laughs> a friend of my wife's wanted tickets for Christmas to mm-hmm. give the husband... And I was able to, it's the one and only time I've ever been able to organise them, but they're like, they were 350 quid for the Bayern Munich game. That wasn't, oh, yeah. t- that's not touting. That's the price yeah, that yeah, they officially yeah. are. Yeah. Um, like the Champions League final tickets are 450 quid each wow. in Madrid, um, which would be some crack of Atletico yeah, were in. Before you factor in flights and everything. Oh yeah, and the, and the hotels go up. Like yeah, I know yeah. Palomar was looking at it the other day and he said, the because ho- we can actually go this year because TV3 are doing the final. Um, <laughs> so we can go if we want. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Virgin Media. <laughs> yeah, sorry, um, their own employees. Yeah, do that as yeah, well. yeah, yeah, I know. That's f- absolutely. But um, they, they're doing the final this year. But like a hotel room that was fifty quid, you know, tonight is a thousand euro the night of the final. Yeah, oh yeah, so, like, I mean, I remember hearing well, I mean, Liverpool that. fans like spending upwards of three or four grand just to go over and yeah. watch the final last year. Yeah, I know. In Kiev. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right, Darren. Yeah. Did you ever work a shit mm. part-time job? Did I? Yeah. No, I don't. Th- by the sounds, of it, I don't think you had time. No, I didn't. Were... Re- I have to say, I didn't really. I tried when I was in Beaumont Hospital, because um, I was doing the other radio bits mm. and pieces as well. Um, and not that we had much money at all, but it was everything was you know, uh, it was okay. Yeah. But I did apply to be a kitchen porter in Beaumont Hospital, <laughs> and they refused me. <laughs> I wanted to be a KP, um, and this no, I can't because uh, I was I was in there at the time, and I think the reasoning was well, if we take him out of do- volunteering in the oh, radio, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, which yeah but that just, can be your second career. Too. That could I be, think yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are, you, are, you, yeah. are you dab handed home with the washing up? No, I'm, I'm, yes, I am okay. actually. Yeah, okay. loading the dishwasher. <laughs> 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 the stuff's cleaner before I put it in than mm-hmm. before it comes out. No, but I actually, yeah, I would be good at washing dishes. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So yeah. it could be a potential second. Absolutely, okay. yeah. <laughs> I know, but I might need it anyway. Um, mm. Dara, do you take a drink? Yes. Occasionally, what, what's your drink of choice? Um, a Coors Light or Sauvignon Blanc. Okay, very okay. nice. And we don't. Um, so you've got a couple of bottles of that for me here now. Have of you? course. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm I'm joking. I'm cooler, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, well, look when the opportunity presents itself. But like, you can't. Like, uh, you know, we we have to be. You know, there's just not that many opportunities to yeah, do it, yeah. you know. Um, um, but with that in mind, yeah. uh, three guests, living or dead, that you'd invite out for a oh. lovely pint of Coors Light or a lovely glass of Southern. Oak. Three guests. Yeah. Mm. Good lord. Um, do do do. Seamus Darby would be one. Okay, of course. And That's I might the roots off coming the in. Yeah. 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 Um, so that he'd be one. Actually, um, fast, uh, his whole story about going over to... Ah, uh, yeah, sleeping on amazing. the floor. Yeah. We did it. I was involved in the documentary that was out over Christmas Very good. with him. And I, I'd been trying to kind of get that done for uh, 10 years and just couldn't bring on... And actually, I didn't have any... Look, I was I was involved in the background, but a brilliant guy called Cormac Hargadon from Loose Horse made it. Okay. And that's his gig. So it just kind of was involved in a few bits of it. But he brought all the, the elements together. So Seamus Darby would be one. Um, I think Messi would be two, mm-hmm. um, and three would be Ronaldo. Ma- and let them fight it. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, um, no, I wouldn't go. No, not Ronaldo. Um, Muhammad Ali. Oh, yeah, fantastic. So yeah, that'd be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, listen, they probably wouldn't talk to each other. <laughs> uh, but that's fine. I just talk to them. Maybe you could do it in phases. Have a, a six <laughs> o'clock. Staggered. Yeah, yeah, six, yeah, eight, yeah. and ten. But yeah, maybe those three. Uh, like I've always been, like Seamus's thing is just because it's so real mm-hmm. and it's the most famous goal ever scored in the history of the GA. And I, there have been so many documentaries made about him. There was an RT radio one last year where somebody said, do you regret scoring the goal? Because like everything went wrong. After it. Um, like his family broke up. He lost his business, his home. All I end up sleeping rough on the floor of a pub yeah. in London. Then, then he said the carpet was black and everything. Oh, if there was even carpet. Yeah. But like a guy met him on the pitch after he'd scored the goal. And he'd been there in 1972. So, you know, he was one of the, the, the more senior players. And the guy said to him on the pitch, well, Jesus, Seamus, you'll never be poor again. Oh, yeah. And like, how, like, 
I think it was four years later, mm -hmm. he's sleeping on the floor, mm -hmm. rough, you know. So, um, yeah, that, that's he's just look, all of those guys, they'd be kind of my heroes. That that mm -hmm. 82 team, because of my dad, I was kind of brought up on them, first final and all that stuff. So, I've got to know a few of them, Sean Lowry and that, and they're amazing people. So, anyway, and they accept you even even though you're a bit of ah, uh, yeah, no, I'm know. like, a, this is no problem. Yeah, I, I say what they want, I tell them what they want to hear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gaff over here. All right, so Darren, before, yeah. before we wrap, we always ask our guest any advice or the best piece of advice that's been hard on yourself. Good lord, um, any advice? Don't talk as long as I've done. <laughs> uh, this will be like the longest podcast. Do you need extra media space? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, was meant I, to, I, I was meant to meet Ross at one o'clock. That hasn't gone well. Oh, you'll um, tonight, of course. No, I'll yeah. ring him because oh, I have to. Yeah. Yeah, I'm out. <laughs> like, see what I mean? The world record. Yeah, um, don't talk bullshit like I've just done. Keep going. I suppose in this day and age, learn as many aspects of uh, about your about this business as you can. You know, it, it no longer you have to know how to do everything. If you like, say when Ulster Television was down here, like I remember meeting um, some of the reporters at, at events, and like say if it was us, um, you know, you'd have a cameraman. In times gone by, you'd have a producer. That's not the case now. But you have a cameraman with you who shoots the thing. All you've got to do is get the subject and ask them questions. This I remember meeting this person was doing the whole lot, yeah. you know. And that's that's the way it needs to go. And you know, em embrace the technology as much as you can. And and you know what? Always, if you're writing something or broadcasting something, just always check that it's correct. Once, twice, three times, it's never enough. Because it's it's your name, it's your reputation. If you get everybody makes mistakes, I've I've made a career out of making mistakes. <laughs> That's what happens. Stuff goes wrong. We had it the other night about um, ah oh, fucking hell. I I mentioned that he, the Bayern manager. I said oh he'd been at Dortmund and he wasn't. Uh, he would have played there, so okay, you could sort yeah, of say yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, but I'm sure he, some he, smart Alex on. Uh, no, well I I so I'm I don't do social media anymore. So. Um, but I'm quite sure that did happen. Yeah. But like what you don't know won't hurt you. So uh, leave it alone. But um, yeah, ju listen, just keep going. Be persistent. Learn as much as you can. Listen to like the, the professionals that you have around you who are teaching you here are the best there are. Um, and as much of this stuff, I've all listen, you know, if you want to be a broadcaster, you want to be on radio, do radio. Do it like this mm -hmm. and do more. Stuff written down in a textbook is great. You have to know it. There are your basics. There are your like when I was doing it, we had to learn shorthand. Oh, Hitman yeah, script. Course. I can show you now if you want. Like, but you just tape it. And like, you know, again, when I started out, you had a big tape recorder. I remember with where I live up near up near Drogheda, um, like I'd go and do a match in Oriel Park. I'd record an interview with Dermot Keeley, who was the manager, or Jim McLaughlin. I would drive by my front door into RTE. I'd have the cassette, I'd take it out of the machine, put it on a reel-to-reel -reel thing, edit it with tape, splice it together mm -hmm. with the, you've seen those splicing yeah, yeah. blocks in a museum in again. A museum, <laughs> of course, um, yeah. And then I had to put it on another a cart to play it off a cart wall for the next day for the guy. So now I, we can do this thing, You can, if you have big enough Wi-Fi, you can send that interview anywhere mm -hmm. and it's instant. To the, so these are all brilliant advances and they help you so much. Um, but you know, th th I've always believed, I remember coming in here about 10 years ago, friend of my dad's his daughter was doing the same course you were doing and there were a few of us asked to give their impressions of, of uh, you know media and where it's going now and it's very different to now to, to the way then. it was then and how kind of fractured it's become um, but I was you know my big thing has always been practical if you if you want to write go and write mm -hmm. and show me the stuff you've published if you want to do TV or broadcast get broadcasting hospital radio podcast whatever the hell it is do it and like I was nearly run out of the place because it's like, hang on, we've all these, you know, bleh. and I was like, look, I'm sorry. Like if the guy, if a guy or girl comes into me tomorrow, for example, not that I have to make these decisions, but I know myself with the greatest degree that DCU has ever put in front of, you know, has ever given anybody mm -hmm. the world record, the, the most qualified person there ever is. But if he or she can't sit in front of that microphone or that camera and do their thing, if the other guy or girl comes in and has whatever their qualification is, but if they can perform, that's it. And I suppose that's the big word. You've, you learn how to perform. When you know, you're at your most terrified, when you're at your lowest ebb or whatever the hell it is, learn how to perform because that's what it is. It's a performance element uh, as well all as the all the, the skills that you have. You but so it doesn't far. tell you how to... St like, you know, like I did a thing for UEFA before Christmas, a draw. I was absolutely terrified. And the first minute of it was crap. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it was the draw for the Nations League semi-finals. And what happened to me was I looked around the room in the Shelburne Hotel in Dublin and I was like, God, yeah, he's the Portuguese manager. Jeez, there's Gareth Southgate. That's a nice waistcoat he's doing. And I was fine up until then. And when I started, I was like, oh, crikey. And the room was really warm. I could feel myself sweating up like a horse <laughs> in the parade ring. I was like, oh. Um, but it does happen. So, and that actually, uh, you know, I wasn't very happy with the way the thing, I, I steadied down after it. It was about four minutes long. Um, I steadied down after it, but um, at the start of it, I was like, God, Darry, you made a pause of that. You know, but it calmed down a bit. Robbie Keane, I did a bit with him, so the friendly face always good. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? Just just learn how to perform and in, in the, the most extreme circumstances, whether it's Theresa Mannion that day when she nearly been blown mm -hmm. down the road, but at the same time, she got the message across and she did her stuff. And if you're in the, the, the groundsman's shed in, in, I was going to say the hey, place, don't. so I'm not going to do it. Um, if you're in the groundsman's shed in that game, you've got to get the stuff out there. You adapt and, and you that's, perform. And that's not written down in any textbook. You've got to learn how to do that. Brilliant. Um, and I, I think you guys can do it. So Thanks. keep doing it. And hone it. And don't talk to a yes, merchant like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, mm. um, you have been listening to In Conversation with... If you're still awake, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> with Darren Maloney. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you again next week.